Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Musto, and welcome to Siemens Startups, a podcast series where we speak with startup entrepreneurs to gain insight on how they turn great innovative ideas into successful, profitable companies. In this episode, we are speaking to Deflect LLC, the developer of the Roof Rider system, a unique product that significantly improves the aerodynamics for transportation and passenger trains. We will also hear how an entrepreneur with a background in economics and statistics and a CTO who came from the automotive industry have landed in the field of train aerodynamics. My guests today are Spencer Main, CEO, and Adrian Villar, CTO of Deflect LLC and the creators of Roof Rider. Before we begin, please let me know what you think of this episode. You can leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or email me at paul.musto at siemens.com. Thank you, Spencer and Adrian, for joining us today. And uh, before we get started, would you please tell us a little bit about yourselves? Hi, I'm Spencer Maines, the founder and CEO at Deflect LLC. My background is in statistics and working in the rail industry on estimating the effectiveness of various technologies for reducing fuel consumption in the freight rail area specifically. Adrian? Hi, so my name is Adrian Villar. My experience is mainly on automotive I started in motorsports, specifically in F1, uh, where I worked for a few years, and then I went to the automotive industry. Yeah, now I'm working with Spencer in Deflect LLC, which is quite interesting. Fantastic. And thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. So uh, you both have some interesting backgrounds. I'll start with Spencer. Economics and statistics to doing train aerodynamics. I know you mentioned it in in your intro, but maybe you can explain kind of how the things tie together. So yeah, I got my master's in statistics and I was looking for a job and I found an interesting one working for a U.S. freight railroad in terms of working with their fuel data. And from that, just appraising various technologies to see their impact on reducing fuel consumption and uh, various strategies that the company was employing. And it seemed like a big area that was missing was aerodynamics and technologies to reduce aerodynamic drag. Thanks for that. I guess it makes sense. So tell us a little bit about the product that Deflect is, has developed. So the roof rider works on the inner car gap of trains. Generally, you have to leave a gap between cars to allow the train to turn and allow mechanics to get into that area to fix the coupler and that sort of thing safely. And on freight trains, allowing for the switching of cars as well. But that gap can cause a lot of extra drag. Compare a train to trucks on the road, generally speaking, a train is going to have much, much lower drag because of the large drafting effect that occurs between cars because of how close they are. But there is still usually some distance between those cars that's due to the intercar gap. And so really any way to reduce that drag is going to be really useful for railroads because any amount of extra aerodynamic drag is going to increase energy consumption and potentially slow down trains as well. So I guess that leads into my next question about what is the product concept itself and how does it actually work? So the vast majority of previous strategies for doing with this drag was to try to cover up the inner car gap or shorten it by bringing cars closer. But what was really neglected was any strategy to deflect air around or over the inner car gap. So that's what we're trying to do here is using a much more cost-effective solution that doesn't interfere with mechanical work that needs to be done on the train or the ability to switch cars or that sort of thing. So it's just a short deflector that's less than an inch in height that you place on the roof of a train. It shouldn't break any height limits related to tunnels or bridges or that sort of thing. It's really just one inch? Uh, it's less than that. The current design we've been using is about 0.72 inches in height. For subway trains, for instance, it needs to be less than around 0.82 is what we found to avoid the height rules that they place in those trains. And that's enough to deflect the air enough to reduce that drag? That's been enough in the uh, CFD and moving scale model tests that we've run. Fascinating. Thanks. So I was looking through your website. Uh, we'll get to back to some more of the technical pieces when we get to, when we speak with Adrian. But uh I came across your mission statement, and I actually did find it very interesting. Here at Deflect LLC, we work to deflect air, never the truth, 
We are devoted to using ingenuity, scientific knowledge, experimentation, and data in order to reduce carbon emissions in the transportation industry. We believe that testing should always be performed to obtain the most accurate estimates of impact and not to help sell a product. Most companies, that's all what they're all about is selling product, right? So that's what kind of caught my attention. The emission statement was higher than that. So is there an interesting background to how you came up with that? So my background is in statistics. And in the past, I had to work with a lot of vendors and devaluing their products. And I always really disliked the testing results they brought us because you could usually apply a rule that the actual savings would be about a third of what they were saying. And there were usually things that were done with the testing that caused that. So it's really the analytics you're saying is kind of driving the product design and the innovation of the product design rather than just the quest to make dollars, right? Yeah. <laughs> of course, both at the end of the day for a small company are very important, I'm sure, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, from a competitive perspective, are there other companies out there that are doing the same? And how does this stack up against those other solutions? Not really. There's a number of companies that have looked into the aerodynamics space on trains and, and on high-speed passenger rail. There are products to cover up the intercar gap and that sort of thing. And there's a number of patents that have been made to deal with the intercar gap, but nobody really selling anything. So Spencer, uh, you know, in starting a company, it's really difficult as many in our audience probably realize. So can you shed some light on some of the challenges that Deflect faced uh, early on? And, you know, I'm talking both from a business and a technical perspective. So yeah, we tried launching right at the start of the pandemic and in certain ways that makes some things easier and some things harder. Generally, it's much harder to get in contact with railroads to gauge their interest in that sort of thing because there aren't conferences or anything like that. And so if you don't know anyone in the passenger rail industry, you have to try to cold message them and that sort of thing. And that's usually not a very effective strategy. But there have also been big positives to the pandemic. Um, I never would have been able to contact Adrian otherwise just because it's allowed for remote work so well. And that's interesting. But you were able to kind of persevere through. I mean, trains, I think, were still running through the pandemic and so forth, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of passenger trains were still running, usually just the ones, the public railroads, because business-wise, it wasn't really making sense, but legally, they still had to continue. So there's been a massive boom in shipping and transportation in general during the pandemic. And did the train industry also, I guess, benefit from the same effect, right? Everybody's mail ordering and everybody, everything's being shipped. And so did the train industry seem, see a similar uh, positive inflection as a result? So initially there was a big drop in the freight industry for the first couple of months of the pandemic, especially yeah. the auto traffic because the manufacturing of automobiles almost completely stopped in North America. But then towards the end of 2020, traffic was way up due to the shipping, especially intermodal. Yeah, I know. I was trying to move to find a, a shipping company to come and move my stuff was was difficult. So, <laughs> and actually, I have some friends in the industry too, and they said that uh, it's been a real challenge keeping up with demand. So, interesting. So, let's uh, shift over to Adrian for a few moments here. And uh, Adrian, again, thank you for joining us. Based on the on the title, I'm, I'm to assume that you are driving the technology development of the of the Roof Rider Deflector. But before we get to that, you also have an interesting journey uh, here as well. And can you share that? Yeah, so as I said before, I, I started mechanical engineering and then I decided to do a, a master's in motorsports engineering. So I moved to, to the UK uh, to study that. And then I was lucky enough to, to be able to start my career in Formula One uh, from the get go. And I started as a junior CFD engineer. And then little by little, gaining experience, I started working not only in CFD, but also gained experience in experimental testing and became, after seven years uh, working in F1, I became a senior aerodynamicist. After that, I joined Dyson on the automotive part of the business where I, I was responsible for the CFD side of things. Yeah, we wanted to basically carry that experience from Formula One to, to the work in, in Dyson Automotive. And to be honest, now pretty much trying to do the same uh, at the flag LLC. So 
trying to get the way we worked in in F1 to to be able to to be the way that we work in in Deflect by having you know processes that are automated and and very efficient overall. F1 to trains. So that's, <laughs> so are there similarities or you know radical differences or are some of both? <laughs> Yeah, some of both. Uh, I think overall, uh, trains has the actual flow field is is a lot more simple than obviously uh, a car like a Formula One car, but it has other areas where it can become quite quite interesting or quite uh, complex. For example, when you're considering a moving train through a high speed train moving through a, a tunnel, for example, because that's when you get into shockwave kind of, well, not shockwave, but uh, wave and supersonic flows and so on. It's quite interesting. I, the basics of it, it's still fairly different because when you're talking about, for example, Formula One, you look quite in detail into the generation of downforce, but drag obviously is just a consequence of it and you try to mitigate it a little bit. But when it comes to trains, drag is the main thing that you're looking after while the lift of the train, you just try to keep it within normal, to say it somehow. But for example, the, that, the source of that drag is, is fairly different to what you see in a, in a car, because in a car, the viscous forces are not as important, while in the train, they're very relevant. And, you know, it's one of those things that, yeah, it's, you, you need to change the way you think a little bit about design as well. I was going to ask if the roof rider deflector was similar to that of an air spoiler of a car, but I guess you just explained that's not the case, right? Two different purposes, right? <laughs> Some of the, the 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 physics are are pretty much the same. It's just how how to deal with it or what you want to do with it is a bit different. Yeah, exactly. So I, I know that Spencer mentioned it uh, a little bit earlier, but can you kind of explain a little bit what's happening between the train cars as they're you know moving down the track? I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of turbulence between the things and that's causing it. But can you explain to us you know what's exactly going on there and what you're trying to eliminate? In trains, you, you always have an intercar gap that can vary in length depending on the type of train that you're working with. If you're looking at very high speed trains, they're usually devices that kind of block that area uh, a little bit. But when you're looking at more intercity trains or regional trains that are not as fast as the high-speed trains, they don't tend to cover that area. So the flow tends to go into the intercar gap and have like an effect of impingement on the area, on the faces that are inside that gap. So that flow impingement is creating drag and obviously uh, generating that resistance to the train. And that can cover in, in, in trains like meat speed trains, to, to call it somehow, that can be up to 50% of the, of the overall resistance of the train. So it's quite an important factor. And when you're talking about cargo trains, that gap becomes larger. So the, the effect from that intercar gap drag becomes even more important. Thanks. I appreciate that explanation. So can you talk a little bit of uh, the Siemens solutions that you're using and how you're using them to, to help design the product? We chose Siemens because basically the package was the one that adjusted the best to our needs. We chose NX mainly because to me is the, the, the best tool to price ratio there is in the market, to be honest. There's other tools that could be perhaps a little bit better, but the cost is massively higher. So it, it, it wasn't really uh, what we wanted or needed for, for the business. Um, when it comes to Sim Center, I think the way Sim Center is designed is not only a great tool for CFD simulations, but it's basically something that allows you, it's designed to be done in an automated way. So it makes it very easy for the user to automate if you know what you're doing, obviously. And that makes the process a lot more efficient. And when you're a small company, you have to think about the fact that if you buy a software and you have some hardware that you're using to run that software, you have to be using it as much as you can and as efficiently as possible. So it, it makes it very easy to get uh, as much as possible from the package itself. So that's, yeah, I think that's why uh, we chose it. So it sounds from talking to both of you that, uh, you know, based on what Spencer was saying before and the kind of the mission statement around the analytics and data, there's a, a pretty intensive process of design and simulation that goes on before you actually produce the product itself then? Yeah, 
I think at the beginning, uh, before I joined, the initial stage of design was done by University of Birmingham, where there's quite a lot of experience on, on they have a lot of experience in the field of train aerodynamics. But now, obviously, we, we need to take that uh, development in, in-house. That's why we're trying to make it as efficient as possible. But at the moment, all the effort is being put into making sure the results that we're getting are as correct as possible and uh, as reliable as possible. Because otherwise, you know, we are, if we're not sure of, what, of the results, then we are putting ourselves uh, at risk, basically, as a, as a company as well. So... Uh, so yeah, that's where the effort is being put into at the moment. Excellent, and and the experience so far has been good. Yeah, yeah, I think there's still a lot uh, of things that we need to work uh, on, and a lot of questions that we need to answer. Uh, but but so far, so good. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate it. So I'm a bit of a car guy, so I might follow up with you to talk to you a little bit more about those motorsport aerodynamics. So, <laughs> no problem. Uh, I find it fascinating. Spencer, well, let's come back to you for a few moments here. Looking forward uh, for Deflect, what challenges do you do you anticipate? Again, again, from both a technical and a business perspective, something that's educational for those young entrepreneurs that might be listening. The biggest thing right now is there's still a lot of testing that needs to be done in terms of a lot of the previous testing was done at model scale. So we need to make sure that things still work at full scale in the same way. Um, is one big thing. We need to make sure that there isn't a sound impact. Uh, we haven't tested it in tunnels, as you would see in a subway, for instance, where the drag can be a lot higher and the aerodynamics are also just really different. So we need to see whether or not it will still work in that kind of tunnel. I hadn't asked before, but uh, are you close to having a production product that's available f- to, to be used? Probably six months to a year, I'd say. Okay. We're still wanting to do a little bit further optimization and that sort of thing. Yeah, excellent. And so in general, what are the goals for Deflect? What's the next step for Deflect? I guess get that product out there, right? <laughs> yeah, get ready for a field test. Because yeah. from CFD work and wind tunnel work, we should have a pretty good idea of what the aerodynamic impact is. That doesn't necessarily give us the best idea of what the impact on energy consumption is. We're still going to have to do put these on trains and compare with a control set of trains and see how much the energy consumption of the trains with the deflectors applied is going to change. I would have to believe that the uh, industry would be very receptive to this, right? I mean, you're, you believe it's going to save fuel costs and cut down on a lot of drag for these trains, right? So we, We've been able to collaborate with some passenger railroad so far, so... We also need to continue expand on the work that we've done so far on, on in terms of risk management as well, just to make sure that is uh, very safe to to use and so on. We've done some work already on. Uh, I think where the materials and, and the work done it's is gonna it's above the requirements of the of the actual uh, pieces, so it should be fine. But we need to to continue working on that risk management. There are a lot of safety things you have to worry about in the passenger rail industry. You have to worry about it hitting something in a tunnel and flying off and causing damage. You have to worry about pressure impacts inside of tunnels um, because they're, for high speed trains especially, there are pressure waves that can occur in tunnels and hurt people's ears and that sort of thing. And then there's also blowover impacts on trains. So you do need to worry about the lift. A little bit, not as much as on passenger cars, but you need to make sure that there isn't so much lift that you could have a blowover or something like that. Yeah. Right. So are there government regulations and, you know, that you have to comply to with something like this? In, in some cases. Not as intensive, though, for like as the automotive industry or anything like that, right? No, no. In, in the automotive industry, you have to test every single car prior to being released on in every single configuration and so on. Uh, so it is a bit more uh, strict on that sense. Thanks. I appreciate it. I was going to ask you what drew you to Siemens, but I think Adrian did a nice job. Is there anything else you wanted to add uh, on your side, Spencer? Yeah, I've been really pleased with Siemens and everything Adrian's been able to do with the product. Appreciate it. One of the uh, other things I wanted to ask you about was you've worked with one of our channel partners, Maya. Can you talk a little bit about working with them and what that's been like? Yeah, they've been really helpful in working with a startup and get every, everything done. They've been very supportive. The typical thing when you're starting, you you always have some some 
technical issues and they've been helpful at solving all of them basically so so yeah we can't complain on that sense <laughs> so um finally uh, any parting words for our aspiring young entrepreneurs out there and when starting a company i'll start with you spencer <laughs> yeah um you, you might not think of yourself as the entrepreneur type but um you can still do it because I, I never thought of myself as being really the entrepreneur type it's a very scary thing uh, it's a it's, an, it's a difficult process but yeah i think the journey as well it's it's quite important for professionally i think you learn a lot more when you're doing a, a startup than when you're working for a company because you pretty much have to do everything <laughs> at the beginning yeah. so it, from the professional standpoint i think it's incredible so uh, it's a unique experience and i would recommend everyone to to, to try and do it but obviously experience is it, it, it can, can also play a, an important factor on it I think that's fabulous advice. Uh, I'm going to couple that with the advice that uh, from from our last podcast, where the person said, "Just don't take no and as an answer, or that you can't do it." Right? Think of yourself as a an entrepreneur. Take the chance and just do it. Right? So I've worked for companies all my life. I've always thought of starting a company or uh, going out on my own. I wish I did, and maybe there's still time left. So um, <laughs> I'll have to continue to think of myself as an entrepreneur and, a, and somebody who could do a startup. Uh, as I said, so, Paul, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they said. Don't take no for an answer. <laughs> never too old or, or never too mature <laughs> to do that, right? Uh, and then find someone to be your uh, co-founder. That's the thing I'd say too. <laughs> It really helps to have someone to bounce ideas off and that sort of thing. Yeah, you push, you push each other. <laughs> Actually, I think that's a great piece of advice too, right? Uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day, Kevin O'Leary, right? Uh, Mr. Wonderful from the TV show. The You know, he was talking about the fact that, you know, you don't need to be a master or an expert at everything, right? You, you partner and you work with other people who are experts in their field, right? So if you need a software engineer or an aerodynamist, you find that person and you partner with them, right, to, to, to make the company successful. And everybody contributes and brings something to the table that helps the overall company grow and benefit from it, right? Great advice as well. So well, that's good. That was excellent. Thank you again, Spencer uh, and Adrian. I really, really appreciate it. And we sincerely appreciate you taking the time to do this with us today. We truly hope that you are highly successful in your endeavor. I guess if you want to learn more about the Roofrider system, you can go to roofrider.net. Check it out there as well. I found the, the page uh, interesting as well, and kind of learning a little bit about trains. So appreciate that. So I want to thank everybody for listening to today's podcasts. At Siemens, we understand that getting a startup off the ground is not an easy endeavor and understand the challenges of early stage startups. We are striving to help companies turn their ideas into reality and meet their full potential. It is our pleasure to tell their stories and inspire other startups. If you have an idea for your own business and looking for software solutions partner, visit us at www.siemens.com slash software for startups. You can also visit Maya HTT's website at www.mayahtt.com. This is Paul Musto, and thank you for listening to our Siemens Startup Podcast. Again, please let me know what you think of today's episode by leaving a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or email me at paul.musto at siemens.com. And remember, innovation has no boundaries. Thank you. 